first thing again is I just want to welcome you here this morning and welcome to the Odyssey Church. I mean, uh, I hope you all are doing well this morning. So good to see everybody here on the Super Bowl Sunday. A lot of people stay home to watch the game. It doesn't even start until 6.30, but the activities start early. They make an all-day event with it. So, man, I just uh, appreciate it. I, I think, again, I think you need to give yourself a round of applause, Joe, just for being here this morning. <laughs> Go you! <laughs> I mean, you think about this. What a great way to start the week. You're already ahead of most of the world, man. You've, you've already come to, Lord, to the church and you're praising God. I mean, I can't think of a better way to start the first day of the week. And it's only about 1030. Amen. So if this keeps up, just imagine how great your week's going to be, right? So, you know, way to go. Uh, but I am thrilled you're here this morning. And uh, if this is your first time here, and I don't think I'm looking around, I don't think anybody's first time here. But if you haven't been here a while... We've been talking about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, since the very beginning of the year. Of course, we're a Christ-believing, Jesus-teaching church, so what else would we be talking about? You're going to come to church every week here, and you're going to hear about Jesus Christ, the Son of Messiah, the Son of God. So I just want to let you know about that, okay? Uh, it's this Son of God who offers forgiveness of sins through repentance and uh, trust in Him by making Him Lord over your life. But specifically since the beginning of the year, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. And the author of that is a, a man by the name of John Mark. And uh, God used him to author this account of Jesus' life. So we've been looking at what he has to say. And I sort of can't wait to dive into this morning's message. But before we do, I, I just want to give you a little bit of information, a little bit of, of facts. But uh, as, we, as we get into it, I want you to think about this question. Now, I don't want you to think about it so much that you miss what I'm about to say, and I don't want you to do what I always do, and I overthink it to the point that, that maybe you miss what God has to say to your heart this, this morning, but ask yourself this question. Am I a fan or am I a follower of Jesus? Again, am I a fan or am I a follower of Jesus? And you know what? This, this could be a new concept to you. You know, maybe you even never even really wondered about such a thing. And if that's the case, and that's good, it means that maybe I'm going right down the, the right path that God wants us to go down. And you could come to the conclusion that, you know, that a fan and follower are the same thing. So does it really make a difference whether you're a fan or a follower? And you might be right. You know, we'll see in just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, you could come to the conclusion that sometimes you're a fan and sometimes you're like a follower and, and that's the way most of the world is. And uh, you might just think to yourself that, you know, you got a crazy pastor up here and he don't even know what he's talking about, so hey, you know. <laughs> but uh, we'll come back to that question in just a minute. Um, most people believe that the Gospel of Mark was the first account of Jesus' life that was written. Now, that's important because if you know much about the Bible or anything about the Bible at all, then you know that the Jews were God's chosen people. So you would think that God would write the first account of him, the Messiah, the, the, this anointed one of God who was coming to save people from the sin, from their sins and be the Lamb of God who, who was going to save the whole world from sin. He'd write to the Jews first. I mean, that would only be logical, right? Yet God's ways are not our ways. Now, what a couple of reasons that we know uh, Mark was writing to a non-Jewish audience is John Mark skips right over the genealogy. He skips right over the birth and the events leading up to Jesus' ministry that would be very important to the Jews because they would know he was this prophesied Messiah. They had read about it in the old scriptures. But a non-Jewish audience, what the scriptures call Gentiles, wouldn't have read the Old Testament. It wouldn't have been important to them. So, the fact that he begins with the beginning of Jesus' ministry and not in the very beginning of the genealogy like, like the other writers do sort of gives us a hint that he's writing to a non-Jewish author. But there's also some other evidence. For example, uh, John Mark explains a lot of the Jewish traditions. If you were a Jew reading a writing that was written to you, you wouldn't have to explain those traditions. You wouldn't have to explain what the symbols meant. John Mark also takes the time to explain a lot of the Aramaic words that he uses. Now, Aramaic was the language that Jesus most often spoke. But he's writing to the Greeks, and they don't speak Aramaic. So he's explaining what the words mean. 
Another thing that I find very interesting is that John Mark was writing to Christians that were under severe persecution. Persecution that we can't even imagine. You know, we feel persecuted when we can't pay our bills. We feel persecuted if somebody rejects us. We feel persecuted. But, but the Christians he was writing to were Christians in Rome who were under the um, power of Caesar Nero. Uh, of Nero. Now you, now, you may have seen a cartoon. You may have seen something on TV with with the with the emperor playing the violin as he looked out the window and watched Rome burn to the ground. Now we don't know if that's true or not. Uh, what we do know and what history tells us is that Nero was not a particularly nice guy. He murdered his own mother. The evidence says he poisoned his own stepbrother. But. As harsh as he was on everybody else, he was even more cruel to the Christians. The fact is, the fire that burned down three quarters of Rome in 64 AD, what they call the Great Fire of the Roman Empire, left only about 25% of the city left, was probably started by Nero himself, so he could build himself a villa to live in that some estimate to be as big as 300 acres. You know? How many people you know got a house that's 300 acres? That's a, that's a pretty big place to live. But what he did was rather than take the blame for it himself, he deflected it to the Christians. He deflected it to the people that he hated the most so that he wouldn't be blamed, they would be blamed, and that the whole country would be after him. The historian, I think it was a historian Tacticus, I could be, yeah, the historian Tacticus wrote that Nero so hated the Christians that he would capture them, he would dip them in oil, and then tie them to poles in his backyard and light them on fire so his garden would be lit up at night. Not a nice guy at all, okay? So, I tell you all that because I want you to know no matter how much you've done, no matter how bad things are, no matter how bleak your future looks, that this same baptism of the Holy Spirit, which allowed these Christians who were being tortured and murdered and, and killed, they, this Holy Spirit gave them the power to live miraculous lives that we read about in the Scripture. And, and no matter where you're at in your life right now, that Holy Spirit is available to you to give you the power to get through whatever you're going through. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, is that it is for everybody. John Mark writes to the Gentiles, not God's chosen people, but everybody else to say, this is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the one that can give you the power of His Holy Spirit to live a life that you cannot do on your own. And it is available for everybody. And everybody means you, and everybody means me, and that power is available to us. All we have to do is accept Jesus Christ as not just our Savior, but make Him Lord over our lives, ask Him for forgiveness of sins, and live for Him, and that power comes upon you. Amen. Now, we don't always feel it, but it's always there. I can't do what I'm doing right now in my own strength. It is an impossibility. We can't take what comes on in here on a weekly business, daily, on a weekly, uh, you know, during a normal week and do the things we're doing in, in the neighborhoods and around the world. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. The mass not there. Yet we do it week after week after week because God's Holy Spirit is upon this place. All right. Amen. So this morning, we're going to be in chapter 11 of the Gospel of Mark. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn in there now. I'm going to be there in a verse, few minutes. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. If you don't have a Bible, there's one left up front there. Uh, please take it. Ten more will be here by the end of the week. Uh, so please, don't feel bad about taking the last more. I'll have more. They should be here even before Wednesday's service. But as always, the words will be up here on the screen as well. Now, from the beginning of Jesus' ministries, we know that he has one destination. He's got one thing that he's headed towards. The uh, book of Hebrews tells us that he was headed towards a cross. And as Jesus draws closer to his destination on that Roman, Roman cross, both chronologically and geographically, he has begun to tell his disciples in more and more detail what's going to happen. And, you know, he starts out by saying, you know, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed. 
Then he gets a little bit more graphic. And now he's told him, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. One of you will betray me. And I will be falsely accused. And there will be a false trial. And I'll be beaten beyond recognition. I'll be spit upon. And I'll be mocked. And I'll be hung on a cross to die. But you know, the disciples are a lot like us. They just, they just miss it sometimes. You know, they now know that this is Jesus the Christ. They just now know that He is the anointed Son of God. And they know He is the King of Kings. And they can't imagine this kind of thing. So they just sort of put it back in the back of their minds. The first ten chapters of the Gospel of Mark uh, tells us about the, the, the miracles that Jesus has done. Uh, John Mark speaks more about the miracles of Jesus than any other uh, author. He speaks less about Jesus' teachings than any other author. But in chapter 11, he takes a drastic turn. 40% of the Gospel of Mark is based on the last week of Jesus' life, which is good for us this year because Easter comes very early. The first 10 chapters tells us of the ministry to the world, but in chapter 11, we get down to the last eight days of his life. And the closer Jesus gets to Jerusalem, the more graphic he becomes. Today we're going to be talking about what's called Palm Sunday. It's day eight before his resurrection. That's why we started this series, uh, Eight Days and Alive Again. Every Sunday between now and Easter, we're going to talk about a different day of the last week of Jesus' life and his resurrection. So next week we'll talk about an event that took place on Monday. And the week after that, we'll talk about an event that took place on Tuesday. Wednesday's going to be a difficult one because it's called the Solid Day. There's not a lot of recordings about what takes place then. But every week between now and Easter, we'll talk about a different day before his resurrection. And then on Easter, we'll talk about the resurrection himself. Hey, here's the thing. We serve a God that is active and alive today. He's as active and alive today as he was on that day. He's as active and alive tomorrow as he was on that day. He'll be alive and active the next day and the next day and the next day. He'll be active and alive for all of eternity. We don't serve a God like Buddha or Confucius or, or Muhammad who is alive and then dead. We serve a God who was dead and now alive. Amen. Now the evidence is uncertain, but most people believe that Jesus triumphal entry, what we're going to be talking about today, took place on a Sunday. We know it was probably either a Sunday or a Monday, but almost all researchers agree that it was a Sunday, and since the church celebrates it on Sunday, that's what we're going to go with. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, eight days, and alive again. Yeah, pretty smart, huh? <laughs> so really, when you think about it, this is a pretty important time, because as we talk about the events on Palm Sunday, it's really only about five and a half days before Jesus will be stretched out on a cross to die. Mm -hmm. And not die for any sin he committed. The Bible says that he was without sin. You know, I had a friend of mine one told me, well, you know, he was a kid. He, he had to mess up a little bit. All kids mess up a little bit. Not according to the scripture. Now, it had to be hard on James and uh, Judah and all his other brothers and sisters because can you imagine having a perfect, sinless brother. <laughs> and he's the older brother. You know? like, uh, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> he's God, Mom. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I <laughs> this morning, we're asking a question. And it's a difficult question as we get in this message. And I know it. Are you a fan or are you a follower? Of Jesus. Now, I don't want to be premature, but I'm going to whet your appetites a little bit this morning. We're going to study this much deeper and go into much more detail in about two months. But I'm telling you, that when we get in that sermon service, it's going to separate the sheep from the goats. It really is. I'm going to promise you. Because this year, all year, the, the, the whole sort of the whole theme of the year is about discipleship and what it takes to follow Jesus. And sometimes what it takes is not what we think it takes. It's not as easy as some people make it out to be. But I, I'm going to have to tell you, I just love you way too much, and I truly do. You say, I may not know you, but you know I do love you. God tells me to love you. I love you way too much not to tell you the hard truths of the Scripture and give you a false sense of security by ignoring them. 
So this morning, as I read these verses found in the 11th chapter of the Gospel, think about it and ask yourself, as we're reading God's Word, what does it mean, as we look at these scriptures, to be a fan or a follower of Jesus? And as you look at your life and contemplate your own life, would you consider yourself to be a fan, or would you consider yourself to be a follower? And uh, reading from the New Living Translation, and I'm going to come to a part where I'm going to explain a little bit, because I think this is one area where the New Living Translation gets it a little bit wrong. But starting out reading in verse 1, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, not Bethany up here, 